What's up, y'all? We're going to evaluate the integral of e to the negative x squared. This is a Gaussian function from zero to infinity, and it's gonna be awesome. We're gonna use polar coordinates, and I'm gonna explain everything in a significant amount of detail. I have a shortcut version of this a method that you can check out, and I've also evaluated this integral in other ways, so you can check that out as well if you like. Now, the first thing we're gonna do is look at what this function actually looks like, and it looks like this normal distribution right here. So if the integrand e to the negative x squared if we call that f of x, then the value of that function is given as this blue line for any given x. And we want to evaluate the integral from zero to infinity, which means we want to evaluate the area under the curve from zero to the limit as x goes to infinity right here. So we want to calculate what this area is. And notice that the function is above the horizontal axis. So we expect the area to be greater than zero, at least. <laughs> now I'm going to set this integral equal to i, so i is a number, and the number is the area, whatever the area is under the curve. Now, we're going to define this integral again, but using another variable. So now we're gonna write the integral in terms of y. Here we have it in terms of x, here we have it in terms of y, and notice that that doesn't change anything. So we still have the same function that we're integrating, but rather than the vertical axis being a function of x, we're now writing it as a function of y right here. So the curve looks the same. You could use any letter you want, s, t, p, doesn't matter. We're going from x, we're going from y. Okay, but we're gonna take these two integrals and we're going to multiply them together. So the left-hand side becomes i times i, and the right-hand side becomes the integral with respect to x times the integral with respect to y. So that's cool. Now, this integral here, though each one, but we'll look at the one in terms of x specifically, that is i, right? Because that i is the area under the curve. And i is a constant. So we can substitute that in for i, rather than saying it's the integral with respect to x. And i times i is i squared right here. And now i is a constant, right? And since i is a constant, we can bring it inside the integral, the other integral right here. And the property that allows us to do that is from the linearity of integrals, but we're literally bringing a constant inside the integral, which we can, no problem. Now we're going to substitute back what i is. So i is this integral in terms of x, so we'll substitute it back in here. And check this out, we've now inserted an integral inside another one. And we can move things around inside the integral because they're multiplied together. So we'll move the dx to the outside. And now, my friends, we've just created a double integral or an iterative integral. Now, this might look more complicated, but trust me, hang in here. Uh, it's going to make it a lot easier. Trust me. We can merge these two powers here by using the product rule of exponents. So if we're multiplying bases, we can add the exponents. And if we add the exponents, we're left with our double integral just like this right here. Okay, so this is our double integral that we have. But before we jump into the math, I think it's quite informative to look at what this double integral actually represents. The function e to the negative x squared plus y squared looks like this. It actually looks like a surface. If we look at the limits as x and y go from zero to the limit as they go to infinity, it looks like this. So if we're only looking at the one quadrant here where we have the y-axis can be positive, the x-axis can be positive, what we're gonna do is we take the surface and we divide it up into rectangles. So imagine this is the quadrant we want where x and y are greater than zero. And the volume of the surface is approximately equal to the volume of all of the rectangles combined. So if we add up the volume of all of these rectangles, we would get an estimate of the volume of the surface. And as the rectangles become infinitesimally small, then we get infinitesimally close to the actual volume under the surface. So this dx dy right here represents the area of each rectangle, the area, the base. So we can call it dA to say it's the area. And to look at what our dA's are, the areas of the rectangles, we'll take our function and we'll do a bird's eye view of it. Now in looking down on our function, we can divide the region up into these squares like this, which each square is the base of the rectangle, and that's our dA, the area, and it has a width of dx and a length of dy right here. So that's the area as dx, dy. We could also split 
the region up, not into, into rectangular squares, but using polar coordinates in concentric circles with lines radiating from the origin like this. And it's just another way of splitting up the area. And if we imagine each of these are columns that extend to the top of our function, if we add up the volume of all of the columns, we get the volume under our surface. Uh, so this is our DA right here. Now, our DA is going to be some distance away from the origin, R, and at some angle, theta, above the horizontal axis. Now let's look at how to calculate this DA, this infinitesimal area, using these coordinates. So DA is like this, and it has an inside length, L inside, and an outside arc length, L outside, and it also has some width right here, dr. If we look at this in terms of our, our x and y axes, this dA is going to exist some distance away from the origin. doesn't really matter too much at which point we count it to uh, for our purposes. Now the other corner of this dA is going to be also be r away because remember this curvature is the curvature of a circle. If we were to extend this all around in a circle, here it's just we care about a quarter circle because it's in quadrant one. one. So everywhere in this inner line is a distance r from the origin. Now these two vectors here, these two arrows, are going to be separated by some angle, say we'll call it d theta. Now how do we calculate the area of this dA? Well the area of a rectangle is length times width. And this is not a rectangle, but it's an infinitesimal shape, right? It's an infinitesimal area. And if you were to zoom in on this, uh, zoom in and take smaller and smaller pieces, so dA doesn't have a finite area. Each dA, each little piece here, does not have a finite size. It's infinitesimally small. dr is infinitesimally small. It's not finite. So. As we get infinitesimally small, this curvature, it's gonna look straight, and the inside arc length is gonna be the same as the outside arc length, so we'll just call that L. So we can approximate the area to be L times dr. Now, in, an in, in the infinitesimal world, it's exactly equal to L times dr. Now, L is the arc length, and we can use the arc length formula, L equals R times d theta, where this is our d theta right here. Uh, so if we substitute that in, we got L is R d theta times dr. And if we do a rearrangement, because this is all just multiplied together, we got R dr d theta. And this R dr d theta is the area of our, our region using our, our new way to divide the region up. So we have our integral in terms of R and theta, but we still have x and y here. And if we look at R, R can be represented in terms of x and y. Using the Pythagorean theorem, r squared equals x squared plus y squared. And yo, like check this out. We have x squared plus y squared right here. So the last thing we need to deal with are the limits. And because the limits are still in terms of x and y, right? Well, x has to be greater than zero. It goes from zero to the limit as x goes to infinity. Same as y, y goes from zero to infinity. So what about r and theta? Because we're integrating in terms of r and theta instead of x and y now. Well, r can go from zero to infinity because we're anywhere in this first quadrant here. So r can extend out. But theta starts on the x-axis, but it can only point up to straight up to on the y-axis, and that's at 90 degrees, which is pi over 2 in radians. Cool. Okay, so those are our limits. So now if we plug in all of that, this integral gives us the volume under the surface. This r dr d theta represents kind of the base of those quote-unquote rectangles, and the e to the negative r squared is the height of the function at any given r and theta. So where do we go from here? Well, we evaluate the double integral. <laughs> and it looks like we made things more complicated. If we look carefully at the inner part, we see that it's an integral of r only. We're integrating with respect to r only. And because of that, this blue portion here that I highlighted is a constant. And because it's a constant, we can move this whole constant, this whole integral, 
outside, kind of move it on the other side of d theta because this is just like multiplication, right? So we can move the constant on the outside. And at this point, my friends, we now have two single ordinary integrals to worry about. We've separated the variables, so to speak. Now, we can evaluate these. I'll do the blue one first. This is a u substitution. So we'll set u equal to r squared and then take the derivative with respect to r. And that gets 2r using the power rule. And if we rearrange to solve for r dr, then r dr equals du divided by 2, just like this. So we can substitute that in. And if we do that, we're left with this here. We have the integral of d theta, and then we have the integral of e to the negative u because r squared is u, and r dr, r dr is du over two. So now what we're left to integrate is d theta, which is good, and the integral of e to the negative u. So we can party on and integrate that. The integral of d theta is theta, just like the integral of dx is x. And we're gonna evaluate that from zero to pi over two times whatever this other integral is. And this is our friend, the integral of e to the negative u is literally e to the negative u <laughs> uh, with the negative sign that evaluated from zero to infinity. And at this point, we're, we're almost done. We're kind of on the home stretch. So let's plug away here. We'll plug in pi over two for theta and zero for theta, negative one half. And then this is the limit as u goes to infinity of e to the negative u uh, minus e to the zero because their limits are uh, from zero to infinity. Now you might like writing it like this. Some people don't like it when you plug in infinity because infinity is not a number. So this first term here is zero. It goes to zero. And the second term goes to one because anything to the power of zero is one. So that's cool. So this becomes pi over two times negative one half times negative one. And if we multiply this through and kind of simplify it, we get pi over four. The two negatives cancel and two times two is four. And if we take the square root, we're left with square root of pi over two, plus or minus. So what is it? We have two answers, right? We're left with, the, it's either plus, positive root pi over two or it's negative root pi over two. Which one are we gonna choose? Well, we can reject the negative. Mathematically, we've gotta use the squeeze theorem. But without using the squeeze theorem, we can look at our graph and e to the negative x squared is always above the horizontal axis. It's always above the x-axis, and within our limits of integration from zero to infinity, it's always above zero, so we would expect the area to be positive. So we can proudly say that the integral of e to the negative x squared, our Gaussian function from zero to infinity, is root pi over two. I hope you like this. This was a lot of detail. I also evaluated this integral in a variety of different ways, so be sure to check those out. The more you do, the better you'll get. Cheers.